We actually had a somewhat busy week when it came to X-Men news. We've got the six most important characters in X-Men, according to Axe. We've got a new X-Men team. But more importantly, we got a Jerry Duggan interview with Adventures in Poor Taste, where he basically wraps up his first 12-issue run. But he clearly came to the table wanting to establish some things with this X-Men team. And a lot of the times, I think he kind of failed. And here to talk to me about that is my good friend, Doc. How you doing, Doc? I'm good, man. I'm good. Um, Yeah jerry we do need to say up front this hasn't been like a complete failure like some of the other things that are going on in x-men no. there have been good issues of this x-men series specifically when he's highlighting some of these villains that he introduced it was pretty compelling the art was really good never feel felt like the the run really came together but there were some high moments in here it wasn't an absolute failure so i do want to put that one out there i just don't think he had enough time to do what he wanted to do so here's the first question we're going to cover from adventures in poor taste they asked while X-Men is a Marvel superhero comic, one big way it swerved from that genre and past X-Men stories was the complete lack of interpersonal drama among the X-Men. The team not only got along, but really seemed to like and support one another, even when a member mind wipes a respected journalist. It was refreshing to see. Could you talk a bit about the direction you took with the positive team dynamic? This is what Jerry Duggan had to say. I think I am known for characters and teams that have presented as dysfunctional. The Uncanny Adventures, when I wrote them, could barely stand each other at times. I knew this team needed a different approach. We're talking about a team of powerhouses led by Gene Gray and Cyclops, and they weren't even the most experienced mutants on the team after Sink's journey into the vault. I hope year one was a love letter to a superhero comics and the X-Men in particular. I think the lack of really interesting team dynamics really was one of the downfalls of this run, particularly, Doc. You know, you have Sink and you have X-23 there that were in the vault. It felt like it was set up for this big, weird... Uh, you know, them two coming to terms with everything that happened. He remembers that she doesn't. And they barely even scratched the surface on that. And otherwise, there was no team dynamics. They were just kind of all there together. Across this whole book, the X-Men were essentially um, background characters in their own title. We had the premise of X-23 and, uh, you know, Sync being, you know, this, this will they, won't they thing because of all their time in the vault. And outside of about three pages in a couple of books, they never even addressed it. There was all this setup and all this promise. I, I feel like the, the best way to describe Jerry's time on, on X-Men was disappointing. It was just disappointment. It was underwhelming. Every, every time he had the opportunity to really explore some of the dynamics, he didn't in play in you know, so that he could substitute in a bunch of, you know, mutual admiration society bullshit where nobody disagreed ever about anything. I and it's kind of interesting that, you know, we got the team there. You know, you have the, the setup for X-23 and Sync, but you've also got Jean Grey, you've got Rogue, and you've got Polaris all on one team as well as X-23. None of them wanted to be Queen B. None of them wanted to be the powerhouse of the group. It seemed like that would have been right for some type of uh, you know conflict within the team, especially Polaris being the daughter of Magneto, maybe wanting a bitter, bigger part on the team. She just kind of faded in the background, along with Sunfire, who he's always hated being part of a team. They never even mentioned it. He was just kind of there, and then he left, but he never even said, you know what, I'm going back to Japan, or I think what you guys are doing is wrong, which he's always done on every other team that he's been in. Yes, Sunfire has created chaos every time he's been on a in a team environment, going all the way back to you know giant sized X-Men number one. Then they did it again in the Alpha Flight series. They did it again in the Sunfire and Big Hero Six series. Uh, you know, he was he is not a team player by any stretch. Him getting voted onto a team is absurd in the first place. And then not causing any conflict at all makes exactly zero sense for Sunfire in the context. It doesn't feel of like history. a love letter to, to X-Men because that's ingrained into the fabric of X-Men. It feels like he, he wanted to change it rather than embrace it and say how much he loved it. Absolutely. Know? Absolutely. And and when it comes to having Rogue, Polaris, and, and Gene all on the team, I, I swear to God, Jerry Duggan has never bit, spent any time around three attractive women. You put more than two attractive women in the same room, and at least one will try to dominate another one. 
guaranteed. You would have thought somebody would have been fighting for the Queen Bee status and it never came to fruition. They just all love each other. Yes, exactly. Honestly, more than giant kaijus and getting resurrected from the dead every time you know something goes wrong, having all of these people on the same team and them all get along constantly and never fight like have any sort of interpersonal drama that is the least believable part of this fucking comic book they also asked him this you picked up the baton from jonathan hickman and continue to cement sync status as an a-list x-man and potentially new omega mutant everett's made it clear he isn't going anywhere and almost feels like a third team leader at this point what have you most enjoyed about writing and developing sync this is what jerry duggan had to say sync is a hell of a character and one whose power is always fun to write i think it's fairly clear that everyone respects his 500 or so years in service to mutantum. He's the future, but there's a cost to that greatness. The Hellfire Gala will reveal a startling revelation about what has been going on with him. I hope he survives the Jerry Duggan experience. I don't think anyone that's reading X-Men thinks of Sink as the most experienced X-Men because he was in the vault for 500 years. It was literally covered in three issues, and we saw, like, two days of his life while he was there. I don't think readers think of him that way, and it doesn't feel like that's the way the characters think about him that way. And he's certainly not even remotely sniffing A-list status on the X-Men team. It's kind of ridiculous that they're even bringing him back. Exactly. Um, you know, I, I think picking up the baton from Hickman is the least accurate way to describe what Jerry Duggan has done with Sink in, in this title. For the most of this book... When he wasn't like pining quietly away from Laura and not actually engaging with her, he was portrayed as an incompetent. Yes, he sort of knows how to use people's powers and he will use people's powers, but he was always unsure of himself in every situation. That was the vibe I always got from him. And the idea that anybody respects his 500 years. It's fucking laughable. No, nobody even remembers it most of the time. Nobody yeah, cares. The only one that thinks that way is Jerry Duggan. Yeah. That's the problem. Jerry Duggan thinks that what Jerry Duggan is doing is a lot more important than what readers think Jerry Duggan has, has done or written. Yeah, he's, he's got a much higher opinion of himself than all the rest of us. He tried to elevate Sync, and I, I just don't think it took. I don't think anyone thinks about the character the way he does. Um, we'll see what he does with this second volume. I've, obviously, they got a new team coming up, and Sync will be a part of it. We talked about that earlier in the day. This is another question for Adventures and Portes. You mentioned Dr. Stasis, who is apparently the original Nath Nathaniel Essex. It's a bold reveal and one we'll surely learn more about in the stories to come. But for now, what can you share about the genesis of the idea? This is what Jerry Duggan had to say. The secret of Dr. Stasis goes back to the 30-page document I sent to Jonathan Jordan White and C.B. Sobolski about what I identified as the core need for the line moving forward to reinvest story in villains. Of course, we are writing them as the heroes of their story, and the stuff they get up to now is getting to be devastating. Stasis, Phalong, Nimrod, Omega Sentinel, and then Moira. It's a murderer's row of murderers. I hope mutants survive the Orcus experience. Now, clearly, one of the big things that he wanted to do was establish some more villains because we've created... We've taken all the X-Men villains and made them into good guys within the story. And it seemed like a nice start. You know, Dr. Stasis, Fay Long, uh, Cordyceps Jones, I guess, was the other big one that he introduces. And he, you know, Cordyceps Jones is immediately defeated the one time he's confronted by the X-Men. They beat him in about two pages. So he wasn't very long. Fay Long is now apparently an X-Men red villain. So Dr. Stasis is really the only one that stuck around. And the big reveal is... That he's not an original villain. He's he's the, he's Mister Sinister, who's the main villain in Immortal X Men as well. And it's like, can we get a new character around here? I mean, first, yeah. Once again, <laughs> Doc was right. Jerry obviously here just wanted to in this book. It was very obvious, and I think we even agreed a long time ago. The only thing he really in, was interested in writing in this comic was the villains. Now, that being said, he didn't do anything original here. He didn't even like palette swap. He forehead jewel swapped a villain that we're already getting monthly in another fucking comic. Like, and that was done much better in Hellions already. Yes, 
Exactly. <laughs> Zeb Wells already did Sinister significantly better. Um, Kieran Gillen is doing it, well, better than Jerry Duggan, but worse than Zeb Wells. Mm-hmm. Um, and now we're going to get Jerry Duggan doing the exact same film. I mean, I understand his argument here. Yes, it was very, very clear that you need a lot more villains in this X universe to make it a compelling fucking story because it was very, very, very boring, even during the Hickman era when they didn't have anybody to deal with. And, and the villains that they did establish with Orcus, Nimrod, Omega Sentinel never fucking showed up. So, yes, they absolutely do need new villains. The thing is, Dr. Stasis should have been a whole new character. And, yeah. and an interesting one, too. I mean, it could have been, it should have been some human that we've seen in the background that was a supporting-ish character uh, that worked with Moira and Xavier, worked on Muir Isle or, or something. Hell, it could have been somebody going to the you know, X-Corp era of, of X-Men you know, around Morrison's time. I don't care making him the same villain that we're already dealing with in basically two other series simultaneously is really, really, really just tiring. I I give him an A for effort. He certainly did try to create some more villains because they needed them. I don't think he ever really fleshed them out. Like I said, Cordyceps Jones ended up being a nobody. We'll see about Fei Long. He's got a lot of potential, but I think he's stuck on uh, Phobos or something like that. And then the, um, the stasis reveal just ended up being really disappointing, but well, we do need more villains, that's for certain. Well, the Cordyceps Jones one was all he was was, it turns out, he was just knockoff mojo. That wasn't all that exciting. Kind of a dud way to end the 12-issue series. And they never really fleshed out this team anyway. That's one of the problems. If you're going to give somebody an X-Men team and you give them 12 issues to do their story, it's like there's not well, a whole they, lot you can do. They wanted him to both flesh out the story of these X-Men and you know create their establishment and establish like f- three or four new villains simultaneously which one do you want done because you can't yeah. do them both in 12 issues sorry yeah they just didn't have enough real estate there's another thing that jerry duggan created during his during his time on x-men and it's been captain krakoa the alternate identity of cyclops after he died people saw him die and he resurrected and we're like we don't want people to know that we're, we're resurrecting obviously they know now so he created this alternate persona this is what Adventures of Poor Taste asked Jerry Duggan. The Captain Krakoa identity served its purpose in your story, but for Forge's notes in X-Men number eight, it wasn't meant for Cyclops. Is it safe to assume we haven't seen the end of Captain Krakoa in some form? This is what Jerry Duggan had to say. As a general rule, if anything new flows from Pepe's pen, it tends to be important by the time you get to the end of the story. Well, we got to the end of the first story, and it really wasn't all that important. It kind of felt throwaway and I don't know, a gimmick to sell some comic books with a new character on the cover. Turned out not to be a new character, just like Dr. Stasis, just ended up being Cyclops. But I don't want to see Captain Krakoa. I thought the design, even if it was created by Pepe Larraz, was uninspired and pretty lame. Well, it was a poor design. It was a bland design. I mean, honestly, fucking go back to, like, Alpha Flight Volume 2, Major Friggin' Maple Leaf was more inspired of a design and that was basically a mountie he even had a fucking horse this i mean he's got a bunch of leaves sticking out of his helmet this design reeks of holy shit we got to come up with something on very short notice and to to continue using it beyond that is well let's just say it's just fucking stupid um, it, it should have been a one and done thing it should have been gone the idea of continuing to use it and you know handing this quote-unquote mantle off to somebody else is is stupid well you know what else is stupid doc just from the storytelling standpoint once cyclops can't reveal himself in public anymore he's still the leader of the x-men but he can't go out instead of creating the stupid captain krakoa persona maybe he stands by and he's the operator guy that's behind the scenes And maybe he gives Sink his powers, and he says, you're going to lead the X-Men team because I can't be out there. And they actually flesh out Sink and kind of lift him up and make him not an A-lister, but getting closer there. Yeah, and try to make him that (laughs) A-lister? No, but that's... See, that requires storytelling effort. Marvel Comics in 20... 
well, basically after about 2010, doesn't do storytelling effort. All they do is tell you this character's an A-lister, and God damn it, now they're an A-lister. Yeah, this character's, he's been a mutant or an X-Men longer than anybody. He's spent 500 years in the vault, and everyone's going, I mean, ah, well, it, brother. All they do is just tell us what things are, not actually work it out. They're now telling us that there's these six fucking characters in Axe that are the most important characters in the Marvel Universe now. I know what Jerry Duggan was trying for. We kind of spelled it out in the first issue, or when we reviewed the first issue, we're like, hey, he's trying to establish these villains. He's trying to bring Ben Ulrich and the mystery of resurrection into the universe. Maybe this will play out well. There are some high points. There are some low points. I don't think he ever accomplished what he wanted to because he had such limited time, so many characters and so many uh, things that he wanted to do during this time. So I think he never really got any of it to anywhere close to where he wanted to. But he did try, and that's all you could ask. Look, B for effort and uh, F for execution. If you've ever wondered about Jerry Duggan's stance on X-Men fans, he's pretty certain that he and the rest of the writers are well above you. They're they're more important, and their needs supersede any needs of the actual customers who are paying for the work. He had this interview. He made a fool of himself. If you don't remember this or you didn't see it, definitely check this out because Jerry Duggan is kind of a boob. 